which just happens to be sort of the first year that I played a role in the financial uh, 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 data of the county. And that role was actually not as a county employee, that role was working for the independent CPA firm that did the external audit for the county. Uh, my first involvement with the county was with the uh, tax department. Um, I was over there for about two or three weeks auditing the tax department and happy to say that that was a really good experience for me because it was, uh, as, that, as a result of that experience, I really got to, that was my first taste of county government and really uh, the first experience of realizing just how sound um, uh, the county really is as an organization. And then through the years, I played various roles within this organization. Uh, I started off in later 2007 as an auditor, moved up to audit manager, uh, financial reporting manager, and now my role is as, as finance director. So I'm not planning to drill into some of these numbers. Um, really, uh, we'll get into some of the detail um, shortly, but there's a lot of information to provide. And so the thought is, um, I just don't want to just give you the statistics. I, was, I sort of want to help you understand what these numbers are, are all about. And that is why you have a handout, because I think pretty much anything that you might want to know is in this in this handout as well. There's an appendix that gives you 10 years of financial data, demographic data, statistical data, um, and we're, we're going to touch on some of that, but it's just so much, so many numbers that I, I want to help you sort of understand the numbers and not just sort of look at the numbers. And then certainly if you have questions, uh, I'm open to any questions um, that you have. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to do this all day, just so you know, I'm going to ask a question. We're probably not going to be doing this all day, but 2014, there was a Change in this as value that was pretty, uh, pretty yes. dramatic in the 20, with the 1624. So yes. it'd be good for the commissioner, particularly the new commissioners, to have that year. Um, 2014 to 2015 would really add to that. So yes, yeah. So, that. so you actually have that. Uh, there is, there is the 10 years worth of data. You can't get 10 years of data all on one slide. But in the back of your book, there is in the statistical section. You will have actually every year it shows you the rebounds. The, 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 Does it look like that? Uh, not necessarily like this. I can't break it out. I'm the marketing guy, so okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it's more than happy. It's easier. Yep. Yeah. We can. But, but right if, the, if it read, where is that? And I'll just glance at it. So it is in the back. It is actually under Appendix One. And I think if you would, if you go to. Um, I mean, it is, it's broken out different ways. I just was capturing sort of key. Oh, I'm on that key. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So there's. I can give you. Yeah, it's in that little bitty print. Yeah, but I, I more than that. I don't really like that. I don't. Know. Yeah. If if there's any information you want from it, because again, there's a lot of information. I'm more than happy. I can. I'd be more than happy. 14 and 15 on that slide. Yep. Sure. We can do that. I need that. We've got the people over here that will make that happen. Uh, we'll get it to you probably later today. Good. To, it's good to see how they assess value and that's linked to the tax rate. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so one of the, the things I want to sort of highlight on this, because this is something you really don't see in, in financial data, is actually sort of the middle of that slide, which uh, is the activity. And that is the total resource inflows and total resource outflows. And if you'll look for 2017, we, have, we will, have, will have had, by the end of this year, over 100,000 different transactions come through the finance department. Uh, upwards of over $800 million worth of cash coming in and cash going out. So that is significantly higher than, say, like the operating fund, because what I'm trying to illustrate here is that in finance, we have lots of different things otherwise that are going on. We collect uh, taxes for the city of Asheville and other municipalities. So we've got that money coming in and out as agency funds. We have trust funds. We have uh, reserve funds. Uh, we have the multiple other funds. Uh, our partners at the Tourism and Development Authority, we, we also deal with. So what I'm trying to show you here in, in just that one little line is the fact that we in finance deal with more than just that general operating budget. We've got lots of things going on, cash and investments um, and that, that we're involved with on, our, on a regular <coughs> basis. So this slide is to sort of illustrate that in finance, we don't operate in the back. Um, in most cases, we don't even get to make the rules. Uh, we operate in a very, very heavily controlled environment with um, lots of checks and balances. And no pun intended on the checks and balances. Um, um, so if you look at the, uh, the uh, foundation of it all, it's a state law. We operate under the guidance or under the law of the local budget fiscal control act. Um, and then um, the next layer are the policies that you and your predecessors have asked us for and required um, over the years, which has sort of established the framework for which we operate in. 
And then from there, it's just we layer on the various tools and resources that we ensure that we have consistency, reliability, and sustainability in, in our financial resources. So again, it starts with the state through the law and ultimately ends up with the oversight authority by the uh, state treasurer's office, the local government commission, which really has that oversight that looks at our finances on a recurring, ongoing basis, approves our data issuances, and ultimately um, the local government commission has the authority to take over a government, a government if they don't believe it is being run right. Um, we're not anywhere close, near that, uh, it's, it's the exact opposite for us, but they do have that authority to take over a government, and they have, actually have done that uh, in the past. So. But how do we measure our reliability, consistency, and, and sustainability? Well, uh, through, through three pretty key measures. Uh, the reliability being every year we are required to have an annual, annual financial audit by an independent CPA firm. So we, like required, we get it done every year, and every year we always have a clean report. And this is also affirmed through the LGC, who then subsequent, subsequently affirms uh, uh, those audits. Um, how do we ensure consistency? Well, I think uh, the key measure there is through the Government Finance Officers Association. This is a national professional organization that uh, most all governments, if not all, it, most large governments, if not all small and medium governments, also here adhere to, which is an organization that uh, addresses benchmarking, best practices, and um, um, transparency. For the past 38 years, we have received their <coughs> award for financial excellence in, or for excellence in financial reporting. Um, and how do we um, ensure that our finances are sustainable? Um, I think the key measure there is with the uh, through the credit rating agencies. And so I'm certainly happy to talk about the two AAA uh, credit ratings, our second our, our second of two uh, ratings we got this year, which is sort of key for us, which I think sort of um, highlights um, the strong fiscal management, our robust economic conditions, and the ability to meet our financial obligations in the long term. So I think it's so important that we have those double triple A ratings. I have to actually dedicate a slide to it because I think it's sort of important for you all um, to uh, see that. And so the graph on the left is sort of shows where all of the other counties sit in the spectrum of the credit ratings. And so we are one of nine counties that have the double triple A ratings. Uh, it's the highest rating you can get. Um, and we are, uh, we're one of nine counties and I think one of eight or one of 17 total so there are eight municipalities in the state that have that that same rate. Um, so also give it put in perspective we are the only government in Western North Carolina that have a double triple. Um, Asheville does have a triple A rating they got it after our first triple uh, A rating. I suspect they probably eventually will get it <coughs> but we got there first. Um, so um, and to sort of put it into further perspective, if you look at sort of the institutions in Western North Carolina who also uh, are rated by uh, the big rating agencies, uh, so Mission Hospital, for instance, or, or Progress Energy. Um, Mission Hospital <coughs> is a AA3, which is two ratings below us, and uh, Duke Energy Progress is actually an A2, which is five ratings below us. Those are still very good ratings. I'm not saying anything against them. Those, uh, they have different conditions than us, but I just kind of wanted to put it into perspective as to what that AAA rating really um, does for us. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, really, what does it mean from a government other than just bragging rights? What it means is lower, lower interest rates when we issue debt. So the better the credit rating, the lower the interest rate, the cheaper the money is for us to borrow. Um, and I think as I've got highlighted in there, our interest rates right now, um, our total our average weighted interest uh, on our debt outstanding is less than 3% or 2.98%. Um, so that is, that is, that is good. <laughs> Let's talk about cash and investments. So finally we get to talk about some of the numbers. And so I want to start with cash and investments because oftentimes this can be confusing while seemingly straightforward. Um, if you look at our uh, the first review page, you'll look at our cash and investments and you'll see that we had cash and investments at the end of the fiscal year of 2007, we had $93 million. Uh, audited numbers for FY16, our cash and investments were $161.4 million. And I'm sort of anticipating at the end of this year, 
we will have $180 million in ASH investments. But let me be clear about this. It's, that is a snapshot in time. And sometimes over the short term, there are significant swings. And so we are not a government that operates with level payments that come in over every month. You know, our biggest revenue stream, which is the ad taxes, come in at one, come at the beginning of the year. And so we reach a point and then our cash flows start going down. So it just happens to be that at the end of the fiscal year, we are really at that point where we've reached our peak and we're starting to go downhill. Downhill. If you if you look at the that is a copy of the chief financial officer uh, dashboard that I have. So every day I get to come in and I can look at this dashboard that sort of gives us cash balance. If you look at that, as of yesterday, we had $267 million in all of our bank accounts. But again, that is a short term uh, view of the cash we have because uh, and it's a lot of money. But what you need to understand is that most of this money is already committed. You've already appropriated most of that money. We're just waiting to pay it out. Um, so I don't want you to get the understanding that, wow, we've got a big balance. What are we doing with sitting on all that money? No, it is, we, we were, we're planning for that. So while in the short term it looks like it's a lot of money, finance is in the game on the long term, and we have to make sure that all of our obligations are, are covered. And so you'll see in the, the, the chart above, you'll see like a huge swing, and that really, I think back in 2014, we ended up with $300 million uh, fund balance that I think sort of was pointed out a number of times saying we've got a lot of money that we're just sitting on. Well, no, it happened to be two days before the end of the fiscal year, we had a debt issuance and we had an influx of about $150 million, which were already assigned to capital projects. And so it just, it, it artificially inflated our fund balance, which then um, sort of didn't really sort of give the picture of what our financial condition was at the county. So I just really sort of want to point that out. And sort of these big swings that we see over time really are timing of debt issuances, the timing of um, payments for capital projects in the building, um, the cash flow issue, which I, which I talked about before. And, um, and so one of the things I also want to sort of highlight is that aside from the general operating fund, we had out there $150 million worth of proof, approved projects <coughs> to pay for. So that's pretty significant. So outside of the general fund, which is our regular operating fund, you as a board have approved some prior boards and approved projects. We've got $150 million worth of obligations out there that we've committed to that will need to be paid for out of, out, of, out of these monies as well. So one of the exciting things that we're able to do is through through technology. Yes, question. Um, on the $150 million that's out there, uh -huh. how much of that is uh, quarter cent sales tax to AP tax? Uh, I think probably about $73 million. Pretty close, I think. I think, that's, I think that's about what it is. Yeah. Um, so one of the, our recent initiatives that we've been working on is the fact that through better technology, um, uh, with the help of our business intelligence folks and the help of our partners with our financial advisors, we are now starting to get a handle on what our cash flows are. We are doing a really good job of sort of managing those cash flows predicting what those cash flows are going to be. And, and so what we're able to do now is because of our management of the cash flows and the timing of the projects, we are able to now go out an extra um, six months to a year on our investments, consistent with the policy that you have all set, which really has increased our return on investments. Now, I will say if you look at the investment rate of return from 2007, it was 5%. Those days were gone. You know, we're, we're talking basis points here, uh, but we've increased, I think, what, 40 basis points? Yeah. Uh, in, in the last year, our investments, we've increased 40 basis points, um, so which is which is pretty good, which is which is running higher than uh, the North Carolina Capital Management Trust, so we're pretty excited about that. What are, I mean, is it how you're doing that? How are so doing what that? we're doing is we're, so what we begin to do is we're now modeling our cash flows, so now we're able to sort of project what our cash flow inflows and outflows are going to be. And so by doing that, we sort of have created a, we call it a, an investment ladder. Mm -hmm. So we now know that when we're going to be flush with cash and when we're going to have bigger cash needs. And so now we're filling in that ladder with our investments. So we're, our investments are maturing just prior to when we, when we think that we're going to need that. So we're, we're basically keeping that money in an investment account as long as we absolutely possibly can. 
before we make a big payment. So we know, for example, um, I think usually what's the supplemental payment with basic account is about $14 million. We make it in um, November. Well, November is when we're absolutely sucking air when it comes to uh, finances because it's just before uh, those property payments are coming in. But what, now that we've got our investments uh, set that, you know, about a week before we know we're going to make that $14 million payment um, to the schools, we've got an investment that will mature. So we're squeezing every penny we can out of, out of that. So um, the flip side is now that we've got a handle on the cash flows, we now know we don't have to go out for debt um, as quickly. So what does that mean? That means savings too, because what it's doing is, so typically if you do not have that technology, and, and I, I, I really give the county manager um, great praise for giving us that technology and learning how to use it. But what, what, it, what, it, what it has now done for us is we have, in the School Capital Fund Commission, have, what we have, $72 million worth of proof projects out there. So we're going to have to go out for that financing pretty soon. Well, we would be thinking about doing that now. In fact, we actually were looking at doing it now. But once we start studying our cash flow model, I, we do not need to go after that for about nine more months. So what does that mean? Immediate savings of a million dollars of debt service costs. Now, we're going to pay for that debt service on the other end, but that's 20 years from now. What it means to you is you've got a million dollars worth of savings, which, which was already built into the budget. Um, as a good. But had we not done that, we would be budgeting for a million dollars extra in debt service costs. I probably stayed on that slide a little bit too long, but I thought it was important. Um, so this is a, so I talked about the, 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 the cash and investments in the big number. This is really sort of where we talk about just how solid of an organization we are. Um, so this sort of illustrates how deep our reads are. And so here I'm gonna, we're going to talk about available fund balance and reserves. So we are required to have reserves. Our policy uh, by you is 15%. The state requires 8%. Um, but what it is is available fund balance. And so, uh, so first, what is it? Um, so our general fund reserves really is sort of our operating fund reserves. And it is generally what uh, we use to balance the budget. So when the county manager comes to you and say we're going to budget uh, so many millions of dollars in appropriated fund balance. What she is saying to you is that we are going to balance our budget using our reserves. Uh, and that is why she is always um, very proud of the fact that we just, we are our, uh, um, as, as departments to try to generate savings to ensure that we are not going to have to touch our reserves in order to, to balance that budget uh, for, the, uh, for the year. So available fund balance is measured the ratio is measured by a percent, which is a certain percent of your general operating expenditures. And so, like I said before, the state report is, is roughly 8% is what they want. The policy that you have to on the board is 15%. Um, if you look at our peer groups, which are all counties, as measured by the LGC, all counties over 100,000 in population, that range goes from anywhere from 17.4% um, of re they have in reserves up to 51.3% reserves with an average of 26.8 reserves. Buncombe County's reserves are at 17.4%. We are the absolute lowest county with reserves. So, but what, what does that mean? It means we've got $54 million available in cash. So am I uncomfortable with the fact that we are the lowest in our peer group? No. I mean, it is sufficient. Our policy is 15%. Um, I sort of feel like because of the analytics we have, that we are um, um, really have got good controls over our cash that, that you know, 17.4% is good. Um, and sort of the next lowest is Wake County. So I feel like we're down there with Wake County, but I sort of feel like they've got their acts together. And so I kind of liken it to, um, you know, Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. Like, you know, we don't have too much, we don't have too little. I think we're, we're just right. I, I really sort of feel comfortable where we're at, and I'll sort of also illustrate why I sort of feel that we're comfortable um, with that. So Tim, where are we at? I'm sorry, go ahead. What you tell me, though, is, and then I put on my bank hat, that those that are out there at 20, what, 6% to 27%, they're not being fair to their constituents because, one, they're probably charging too much for taxes, or it's a yes. lot going. So actually, that is a good segue. You're gonna, I'm going to lead yeah. right into a, a, a sort of a, a term that I, I have to describe, the fact that not having too much as well. Well, before, before we leave, leave that, 
you're talking percent. It would be good to know dollars. Yeah. Dollars. I get, uh, I mean, Wake, I mean, Wake County. Uh, so I believe the dollars are in, in the back of your... Uh, compared to everybody else. Well, so, well, yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, if you're comparing this to Wake well, County or, you know, I mean, Burke County, you know, maybe at 26%. But so, their budget is, I mean, they're... Their dollars in reserve may be 15 million. So, but how it, how it translates to 8% is really one month of operating reserves. So, we have two months of operating reserves in the bank. And so, you know, if, I guess, even with that in perspective, if you go to a personal financial advisor, they, they, they recommend 6%. But, um, but really, $54 million is, is, is a fair amount. I mean, it's slowly, it's, the reserves have, have slowly increased over the years. Our percentages, it was 19.8% back in 2007. We're right around 17.4% or now. You know, it's going to fluctuate because the, the percentage is based upon our budget or our total ex expenditure. So, it, again, I think what um, Commissioner Whiteside's um, sort of segues into the next discussion because I want to talk get about that information though. Yes. Can we get the dollar amounts in It's available uh, in the it's appendix in to, to back here. The other one? Uh -huh. Yes, you look at pages uh, tell me where it is, not 8, 9, 11. And 8, I, I'm 8 through 11, it looks like. To point that out. <coughs> the, at the back of the appendix to where appendix 3 starts. So, um, Go ahead. Um, so if you take away, if you don't take away the seven percent of there's about 70 million or something about. Is that right? Probably, that sounds about right. Which would be, would be committed for? Right. right. Which would probably be year in obligations that we would get to pay for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this could probably be a big grab trail and kind of off topic, but you know, there's been discussions in the last, I don't know, it seems to come up a little bit every year, but uh, the question about the, the county schools fund balance too, because they also carry their own fund balance. And that's it's kind of their issue, but of course we, yes, you know, they come to us for funding. and so. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that right now, but just, so, you know, we're going to talk to the schools tonight, but just, would you say that it's kind of a, you know, it's a fair question, how much they should carry, we should carry, so they want to be prepared for emergency. If you want my, my perspective, yeah. my perspective is that we carry the schools fund now. I mean, they are, the, the, the schools are a third of our, our general operating budget. Therefore, I sort of feel like these reserves are part of their reserves. So, I don't want to say, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for them. They may have a different position, but but my position is is that that our fund balance, our reserves, are really there to cover the schools. So 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 just to kind of say back what I think you're hearing, um, you're saying the schools need to carry some fund balance, but in terms of carrying a large one, that shouldn't be needed because we we've, we've got a good fund balance. If there was an emergency, if there's an emergency, the school burned down or something, we've got enough right. reserves. If, if the school burned down, it, it falls on us anyway. We can step in and yes. cover those things. So it's a, it's a conversation that's worth yes. considering. Yeah. It, it, is a, it is definitely a conversation worth considering. Yes. Right. Um, so I want to sort of briefly talk about um, intergenerational equity. This is sort of a social economic term that that uh, I think sort of describes the philosophy of the county. And, and so basically what um, that is, I call it the matching principle. And basically that is ensuring the current generation is paying its fair share and not placing additional burden on a future, a, a future generation. And so also why I feel comfortable with our reserves being at 17.4% is because we have two reserve funds um, that um, I think sort of illustrate the fact that we are covering the liabilities that this generation is creating. And, and the first one is the OPEB, the Other Post-Employment Benefits um, Trust, um, which is basically uh, the health insurance cost for our retirees. Um, so what we have started doing um, several years ago, I think probably back, was it um, 2006 maybe or 2005, I think the county manager sort of instructed that we sort of create this trust fund. Um, and so it started off in 2007, it was $5 million, and what is the balance there now? Maybe can't do that. It's, oh, we're looking at about $18 million um, this year that we will have to cover those post-employment benefits. Um, this was one of the things that the rating agencies zeroed right in on, and we really thought that that was a good sign of our financial state sustainability. We are one of only about probably maybe 10 governments 
um, in the state of North Carolina that are funding um, the, this liability as opposed to paying as they go in the future. So I thought this is sort of important to highlight. And then the other um, reserve fund is our landfill cap and closure fund. So uh, John probably can speak to this much better than I can, but basically it is very expensive to close a landfill and very expensive to main and close landfill. There's lots of liabilities that go with that. And so we are the generation that are filling up those landfills, therefore we should be the generation that pays for the closure of that landfill. So um, I think the fact that we have two reserve funds, and, and this, by the way, it, this liability is fully funded. Um, so um, how does the formula work in terms of how, many, how much funding is placed into the OPE? The the OPEP. So every year we have a, an actual, uh, maybe every other year, we have an actuarial study that's done that it goes out to an actuary and they look at um, health care costs, they look at number of employees, they look at what we contribute. Um, there's, uh, you know, lots of numbers calculated and then they, they come up with what the ARC is, the annual required contribution, and then they also show what the total, total liability is. You don't ask me for that total liability because I'm almost really sure. So it's not a set amount per year. It's sort of just an analysis. Yes, that yes. Is Every year. So we're, we're constantly, to be added that yeah, year. constantly evaluating how many retirees we have, how many that retirees we're projecting to have, um, the cost of health care. Um, there, there are multiple factors that, that go into that, to that calculation. So really what I wanted to highlight here is that this, this really is, when, when, when you boil it all down and you take all those big numbers from the cash investment, when you boil it down, this is really what our, this is, this is our reserves. These are our reserves and, and it's, it's, it's good. I mean, you know, would I like it to be more? Well, of course I would because I'm the finance director. I always want the money. Um, but, but do I think it's, it's where we should be? Absolutely. I have one other question about this. <coughs> so that $18 million number in that analysis, does that sort of mean, it's probably very oversimplified, but if the county closes its shop tomorrow, that's the amount that we need to have set aside to pay those future obligations. So if like, we just kind of wound down the county, we have the funds to pay that, to pay that obligation. Um, and that, that particular amount right there is actually held in a trust fund. So it is not something that I can just get to um, tomorrow. It is something that we would, we would have to work out. Let's not, let's not shut down that tomorrow because I could get to it next week. Right. Is the landfill and the trust fund too? No, landfill is, let, let, we, we, that is internally, we invest that money. Okay, so I always sort of feel like the elephant in the room is debt. So let's talk debt. Um, I'm going to move it, I'm going to say it out loud, from 2007 to this year our debt is more than double. $190 million in 2007. Um, it is, uh, what is it? It's going to be over $400 million. Um, by the end of this year, I think we've got a debt service, we've got a $30 million, $31 million. We have a $31 million debt payment in two weeks. Um, and after that payment is made, our debt at the end of this year will be about $405 million. So, but my goal is to help you understand it and, to, and sort of put that debt in, into perspective. And so that's $405 million. That doesn't include, by the way, the $80 million of projects you all have approved this past year. Um, and we'll be going after that debt sometime next fiscal year, which is what we were talking about in the savings before. But our debt is big. I mean, there's, there's no way you look at that number, that is a big number. But we are a big county with big needs. So I think you know providing the infrastructure is what we do as a county. And so that is what a function of this government is. And so with sound fiscal policies, um, we we can support this debt. And so what I want to go back to back to first to the conversation of intergenerational equity and why we sort of finance um, infrastructure. Because what we're doing is, just like we were saying that we weren't going to put a burden on the liabilities we create today um, on another, another generation, we want that future generation that is going to be uh, receiving that benefit of what we're building today, we want them to also sort of pony up some of that money for that as well. So because we've got great interest rates, because uh, future generations are going to benefit from the infrastructure that we are providing, it is good, sound policy 
to issue debt to finance infrastructure. Is what I'm really sort of trying to help you understand. Um, it is sound fiscal policy, and I will point out that when we went back to the triple, went back to Moody's for our AAA rating this December, this information they fully had that, fully understood that we were issuing more debt, and we still got the um, the AAA financial. Because what I want to show you here in this slide is the fact that we're a big government, and again we've got lots of capacity, and so. Um, this just shows that we are well below the cap capacity of, of, issuing, of issuing debt. Is there a comparison of how our debt compares to other counties? Uh, yes, it's, it's actually in the back of, uh, it's probably the absolute very last slide. I think you'll see, um, where's that? Yeah, it, um, it's the very last slide in the, right, yep. which, which just sort of shows you uh, based upon uh, the other AAA governments and our peer groups, um, we are right where, where, where we should be. And so what I'd also like to sort of point out is the fact that, our po that the policies that we have in place are consistent with organizations our size, um, with organizations our size with the same mission. Um, it's consistent with rating, agent, rating agency metrics. And it is more conservative than the state law allows for. So, I mean, Eric and I actually, uh, just as a point of fact, actually had a meeting yesterday with the secretary of the local government commission. He's a deputy treasurer um, uh, to discuss our debt requirements for the upcoming year. And no questions, no concerns. They were absolutely comfortable with what our financial situation was, uh, what our, our future is. But let me show you why I think we're in, in such good shape with our, with our, with our debt position. So this is a snapshot of what our debt is. So you'll see that 90% of the debt we have out there is for core services. Um, and those core services, 54% is for education. And so most all of the debt that we have for core services is for infrastructure. I mean, so it's infrastructure that we're going to be using today, infrastructure that this county is going to be using in 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, um, and so we are, we are, you know, creating a solid foundation for future generations uh, with, with the infrastructure that we are providing. I'm going to skip through this slide because it's, I'm sort of short on time, but basically this, what, I, what I've done is, is just sort of highlight some of the major projects we've got going on today. You can pretty much know, know much of this, but this is the slide I, I sort of wanted to discuss. And so 64% of the debt that we have has a dedicated revenue stream or revenue offsets for it. So that, and this is the point that I think is really important for you to understand, is that we are not financing this with property taxpayer money. Um, so schools are funded through Article 39 through the School Capital Fund Commission. That is, we get a half a penny of a cent that comes into a specific pot of money and through the School Capital Fund Commission, um, we work that process as to what can be afforded and so, we, so no debt would be requested or issued that cannot, cannot be paid for. Um, and the same is true with the Article 46, the quarterly uh, sub-tax um, for any tech capital projects. But it's a tax. It is a tax. Yes, but it is a tax that not property tax. It's also a tax that is supplemented by the tourists that we have that come from Tennessee, Georgia, wherever, uh, or the folks that come in and, and use our retail. So it, it, it is a tax. You're, you're absolutely right. But it is, it is not necessarily a tax that is, that is um, as much of a burden on our property tax so, um, and, and briefly, I'd like to sort of address the economic development because there's revenue <coughs> offsets for those. So for economic development, I think uh, one of our bigger projects in there is uh, for one of the, I think the General Electric um, economic development issue. I think we own the building. Uh, the lease payments we receive from GE pays the debt service on that. So, that is covered. And the other piece of that is the private development fund at Woodfin, which is being paid for through um, incremental um, tax. Um, um, one question. The GE deal on that, that I thought we had an agreement with them that was covering the debt service on the building, but we're supposed to add the property tax that it would generate because we don't have property tax into the debt payoff. 
Right. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know if I understand it correctly. I think the lease payments cover the debt service, but the benefit we have is the increased value of the business personal property, which generates additional revenue for the, the county. And they have to pay market rate for the lease. They did not get a discount on the lease. So that's a CPI increase. So I thought we had an agreement that they were going to whatever the building was worth, it was worth 20 million, that it would pay into it, just like it's paying property tax into the lease payment. That way, that way, that way, we came out without losing the tax rate, tax on the property. That's where I was. That's what yeah, I, I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I don't know the specific details of that. I'm more than happy to, to take a look at it. But, but I, what I do know is that we are covering our debt service payments through through that initiative. And the market rate is a, an amount that's increased above, and it includes what you would have collected of property tax had you been leasing it.
I'm populating our financial report. Those are all online. They're on the website. Um, I've given you pieces of the financial statements, the statistical section, which does give you more demographics, um, statistical information on debt, taxes. Um, it, it shows the breakout of our finances by function, by functional area. Um, so there are there are resources available for you. Certainly, we are a resource for you. Any questions you have, let me know. You know, my staff are more than happy to sit down with you to walk you through anything. Um, additional resources, the local government commission. They've got a great um, analysis tool. We'll <coughs> let you compare. If you want to compare to any government you want to compare to in North Carolina, we can compare us to them, and you can see in a snapshot. You know how we relate to them. Sometimes I think it's good for peer groups to look at the peer groups. Sometimes I think we have to be careful because we don't really know what their circumstances are, what their situation is. It's it's just one piece of many tools, or one tool of many that we use for analysis purposes. So. Yeah. Thank you. That was good. That no, was good. Good. Before, question I had oh, is how can we make our financial information online more user friendly? So, because you know the average person, so that they can understand. Right. So um, one of the things that we have started, I think um, um, the county manager highlighted you know, in one of her things, and one of the initiatives we started with the school capital fund commission is we're trying to sort of do a better job. And one part of that is technology and system constraints. The financial system that we currently have is 15 years old, and it is so hard to extract that information and just make it readily available. Through Workday, this new financial software, it is going to allow us to sort of plug in. It's, it's easier for dashboarding. It's easier to post that online. So we actually have a transparency initiative online now, or ongoing now, which is going to sort of, over the next probably two or three years, as we get into a new financial system, we're going to be able to push that information out to the public so they can get a better interactive tool to understand what our, our, our finances are. One of the initiatives that we've really got going now with the School Capital Fund Commission is sort of helping them understand what the county's role is in education. Um, and, and sort of, you know, education is a third of our budget. And so it is sort of important for the public to see what the return on investment is on their taxes. And so one of our initiatives is to sort of show them what that return on investment is. So we are actually laying the groundwork as, as we speak. We've got a team, I've got a team uh, working with um, Kathy's folks um, to sort of develop better tools and mechanisms to explain our different revenue streams and how that affects the public and really what that return on investment is for that. So I mentioned at the last, uh, I think Dr. Green gave the, yes, yep. before. That one is the slide that was very similar to this one. Yes. Yeah, so to Commissioner Whiteside's point, if it could be designed where you can actually click on these things and dollar amounts pop up, detail that pops is, up. Right. So what we have, you know, and keep this, you know, very visual to where, you know, somebody in middle school or high school is expecting yep. to Speaking of middle school, it's a peak of intermediate, not peak of middle. So, you know, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We were, that was, I think, Sunday, Saturday night. Uh, so, we'll get that but I, love, I love that. I think any tool like that that makes it easy for people to be able to understand is, yeah. is much better than. And we, and we have sort of laid the groundwork on um, our school capital commission fund page. You can actually now click you on that website. You can click on the school yeah. and it shows you what the project is. It shows you how much we have spent on that. So, um, you can have that for the landfill. You can have that for the apartment. You can have that for. We absolutely can. And that really is sort of. That is something we will strive for. It takes resources, but we are. That is certainly um, one of our issues that we um, hope to, once we get our new system implemented, which is probably the next April, and as we get to that, we will certainly work on that. Good. Great. Thanks. Thank Sorry for taking so much of your time. Thank you. Thank you.
and then give you what I'm estimating as our total taxable revenue. And then also, I'm going to cover, I've listed on here, you, know, you kind of see the real estate tax base update on appeals. I'm going to talk about the past and present of those appeals because I think a question came out on that. And I, I answered quickly, and I need to give you probably a little better information, or at least why it looks the way it looks. Um, and I'll give you my estimate on what I believe of the appeal loss will be. I think that's an important number for our community. Total tactical revenues. I'm going to talk about real estate first, and I'm going to show you all the revenues. And just give you a real high level of how I come up with those and what's involved in those. Food for thought. I used to have a professor that would say, you know, you get down to your other and miscellaneous, but you're better than that. So I'm going to give you food for thought. Food for thought. There's something to think about as you look. So the thing I'm going to talk about here is the growth in the tax base. That question popped up. And I think it's, it's a great question. But I think as you look at that growth, how I think I've worked with Wanda over the years and the commissioners on managing the tax values and the rates are important to look at because I think you guys are at a crossroads of how you make a decision on your uh, tax rate that you're going to do. So, What this is, is looking at what makes up our tax base. And, and looking at these numbers, this is dirt. So when, I, when you look at the parcel lines on GIS, is what this information tells you. So there is 88,000 residential properties out there. Commercial, that's a low number. That's dirt. But when you look at like a strip center, you might see maybe five stores in a strip center. And you go like to an Ingalls store. You see all kinds of stuff at Ingalls Department Store. If you go out to Hendersonville Road, you see a lot of strip centers. If we have one property, but you may have 10 units, like Gerber Village is an example. It may have 20 stores in it, but just one is listed there for 5700 And in vacant land, I think that is ever so important for a commissioner or even planning to look at what is your vacant land and what is still potential to do construction and growth or present use being like farmland and things that you need to consider for our community, schools, things like that. For these time. Other properties that I think are important, community service is more of your federal, state uh, properties. Um, you're going to have churches in there, hospitals in there, your big properties. Those are probably the key exempt properties in the community. Public service is like your utility companies, gas, railway, uh, Dukes in here. Those are valued so differently than what you think. And I'll talk a little bit about those that you can see the value on. Industrial properties. At one time, you had over 1,000 industrial. But what you see is things like in the River Arts District, where they're converting those to other type of uses. You don't see a lot of tobacco barns anymore, or things that plants that we used to have revenue. So that, believe it or not, that has surprised me. The Department of Revenue, that was such a key number, it was in the top three. It was such a big number for counties and value. It's really kind of in a declining area for North Carolina, but it's coming coming back as people convert them into other uses. They're just not industrial anymore. At least not here in Bronx. Recreational, that is uh, actually some of the parks, but it's more facilities like Fun Depot or the Bowling Alleys, places like that that we truly have listed. There's specific uses. So if the building uses, there is some big obsolescence there of how you might convert that kind of box store to something else. So 
we truly identify recreational properties for what they are. But what, I think what's important for you to know, there is in properties that we've set for entities, 124,000. Now there's personal properties, you know, businesses that are at these locations. Um, and part of the uh, vacant land up there, something developers do is, uh, as Wanda talked about, the county has one, and I think what the term she was looking for earlier was triple net lease. I've got a piece of dirt, I'll let you build on it. You're going to pay every cost that comes with it at market rate. And there's a lot of people that do that in this county. If you go up and down Tunnel Road, just about every bit of that, somebody owns the building, somebody owns the land, with different owners. <coughs> they have requirements of how they pay lease rents on that that do include everything. Kind of like if you, if you, when we talk about apartment buildings in our world at the tax office, people that are in apartments do pay property taxes. It is in the rent. They pay utility, they pay maintenance, they pay everything to that investor and return on investment. So these kind of buildings do get rent in them, just like how long talking about that triple net lease, I'm sure that, that GE has. Um, what makes up the tax base? This slide, are, are, I really want to take a little time to kind of go through it. It's a lot of numbers, and I'll come around it. But like in the true land value, 11.7 billion. When we, do, when we do an assessment in our office, we value your land, and we value any improvement that sits on it. You, have, you may have multiple improvements. You may have like a detached garage. You may have your house. You may have some other features on there. Other features a lot of times are uh, other or improvements how we list those. The term we use now is yard item. You know, yard item. But uh, buildings in our community, all of them between residential, commercial, and other type buildings are 26.2 billion. That's a lot of value for the structures in our community. And then other improvements are like your outside garages, uh, probably some uh, like <coughs> small features like gazebos and things like that are in people's yards. Um, buildings like I described earlier about uh, leasehold where somebody leases the land and puts their building on it would be in buildings. Gross value in our county is $38 billion. Exempt properties, things that I have to look at that make changes every year, just one time in four years, like when we do the reappraisal, but they change every year, is like the federal, state, and local government properties are key. Um, hospitals, they're adding new buildings. Universities add new buildings that we have to go out and pick up even though we don't get the tax. But we have to manage those for the fire marshal's office in Raleigh so they can do distributions on those. Present use. Present use is like forestry, <coughs> agriculture, and horticulture three things. Horticulture, you have five acres minimum or more. Uh, you do like berries or shrubberies. You can kind of get into other types of some animals now in horticulture. Um, smaller farms, a lot more of those are popping up now. Agriculture, minimum of 10 acres or better. Uh, both of those have to have a, a, a return investment of a minimum of $1,000 annually. And you can average that over three year periods. So if you got one year you're only doing seven, but you got one year you're doing thirteen hundred, it averages in farm lines. So know that. So they're required to meet that. And I had a bad case this week where somebody was coming out, we just weren't using all the property, but they're trying. And I, I think it's a good program. Uh, forestry, a minimum of twenty acres can be in there. And these guys, they don't cut every year. You might depends on the type of woods. If you got soft woods, they're cutting more often. You have hardwoods there. Uh, it might be 20, 30 years before they cut that stand of trees. But the uh, Forestry Service works with these owners. They look at things like water, bug damage, fire, a lot of things that, that happen in the community. It help them manage the, the stand of timber. One thing I just want to, I want to say in a gentle way to you guys, as you guys see present use come before you as in conservations, Realize when you put a conservation on a property at your level, that is, it doesn't matter if they meet the criteria of that program, they will be in that program for life. It doesn't mean that they have to farm anymore. They have to meet the criteria of the contract that you're approving for them. 
what are the rights of that conservation? So I, don't, I say that in general way because I know we need that land in our community. But at the same time, $765 million is like $5 million off our tax base. But we need it. I'm not saying we should. Now, a lot of that is on our receivables, that if they come out of those programs, we do collect that. There's a rollback period of three years plus current they have to pay. So it's just and just, just to be clear, like that present use evaluation, I mean, the vast majority of those are not, they don't have conservation easements in their land. They just enroll in present use evaluation because it's forestry or farmland. They can just, they're allowed to do that. You're exactly right. It's only, not, and that's why I say in a general way to you guys, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you guys got to make tough decisions as commissioners when they come before you. But they usually come in here with help to do some survey, <coughs> some help for the legal side. And they're doing things to promote good things in the community. I just say to you in a sense, um, you know, it's, you need to manage those too. You can't put everything in present use, but we need some stuff. We need farmlands. I love, you know, was it farm to table when I go to restaurants? I love And that present use evaluation, those policies are set by the state, not local government, right? They are. Yes. Now there is um, variance given at the state level based on training across the state that we're all the same, but I do have to put eyes on the property all the time to look at that. I have found people that I think mean well, they're skirting in what they're doing, but you have to have a real heart to heart. If you don't do it, I'm going to take you out. And you will have to pay a lot of tax. That is a lot of money. So, but it's a good, good program. It is. It's a good program. Uh, elder, uh, elderly exemption and uh, disabled veterans, <coughs> like combine those together. Um, that's I've estimated that there's a piece of legislation this year in Raleigh that may take veterans exemption uh, from 45,000 up to as much as 100,000 is where it's looking like it's going to land. Um, and reading that, um, it could happen this year. I've got money buffered in, in that to pick that up. We could see another $20 million off that tax base for that. But it's a good program. It, when they first did it, they were looking at the very first piece I saw was going to exempt them. Then they were going to give them 50% exemption. Then it popped up in Raleigh where a lot of multi-millionaire disabled veterans that had big businesses in North Carolina. And they're like, well, we don't want to be too generous, but we want to help these guys, you know, men and women. So they've come down to doing more than doubling it. So what we would see for any property is as much as a $55,000 increase. Because I think we have 504. When I look at the 504, around 30 of them uh, are not receiving as much as 50 or 45,000 because their assets aren't worth that. You might be living in a manufactured home or a mobile home that's only worth maybe 10 or 12,000, but they're receiving that. So they're in some cases getting full exemption on that. So questions? I, I should have told you guys, if you got questions, please ask me as I go through it. I'll answer any of them. Question on the, the, the over. Yeah, yeah, we're doing the revets, but what about the elderly? We're 29,000 or something stuck right now. There. Yeah, 20, um, disabled veterans have been um, a little over 300 million. And yes, we have, I think we've got about 5,300 disabled, I mean, uh, elderly exemptions in our community. The elderly exemption, for you guys who don't know, is if you're 65 and older, you have an income that's up to 29,500. You can get in this program, and you can receive from 25,000 off the value <coughs> as much as 50% off the value. Most of them qualify for the 50%. And the reason they say a minimum of 25 is you're living in a mobile home, manufacturing home, and it's worth 12,000. We're going to reduce it. We're not going to get more than that money back, but we're going to reduce it up to. So, but is there any legislation to move that number up? Every year there's legislation for that. I, I haven't seen. Can I comment on that? You can. There is a uh, discussion, uh, I talked to, uh, I think there's been conversations with both senators. I've spoken to Senator Edwards, I think there's been conversations with, with Senator Manna. I spoke to Senator Edwards last week, he shared with me the veterans. Uh, but there's been information given to our senators to take to Raleigh to hopefully increase that uh, dollar amount. To increase the elderly exemption dollar. So there is legislation that they're looking at. Of course, you've got to get 100 
got to get off campus to go with it. But, and, I, and I would credit that as a result of our first retreat. There was consensus among the board that that would be a good thing for us to be able to do. So there is conversations um, that say that. And let me add to that, here's one of those food for thought ideas. If you guys talk to legislators, I mean, I get calls from them. I'm on a committee that I review some of their what if scenarios, and I write narratives back to them, to my honest thought. And in the world of ownership, there's something tenants by entirety. That's, you know, two spouses that own property. Then there's tenants in common, like two brothers, you know, two family members, just two business partners. Tenants in common receive, if their income, both of them's income is less than 29,000, or one's over, one's not, they receive a benefit, one, one half of that ownership. Tenants in entirety, like two spouses, um, they don't. If those incomes, like Social Security for a husband and wife, are over 29,000, they're out. They don't, you don't even consider it. You should, in some way with the legislators, talk about that tenants by entirety role. I see a lot of poor people on Social Security, and they struggle with that because they just went over it, just for it, with both their things. And I see a, a kind of an unfairness, and I understand the ownership, but think about that for a second, you know. I think two people, in a sense, different with the ownerships is what kind of bumps them out with the income. So if you get an opportunity, say, call Gary Roberts, he'll talk in detail. I'll take it. All right, where do we get the elder? Uh, so, total exempt, you see I'm pulling off tax base, 6.3 billion. And that's pretty average. I think right before the reappraisal, it's like 5.8 billion. <coughs> and I do a report to the state for all the municipalities and the county every year to show what that exempt stuff is. So, net taxable value at, at a start is 31.8 billion. I'm projecting on appeals 340 million. And then the total, now remember this one, that's why I put in a little bit of cover. I used to look, Timmy's done a lot of cover. <laughs> um, 31.5, we don't remember that one as we kind of go through. That's, that's the real estate assessment that I'm looking at. Um, talk about the appeals for a second. And it popped up a question the other day on history. I scurried back from the Cherokee to do this report for you guys and I left something off of it. A real small note up here says include, includes informal and formal. Well, I didn't give you the formal my first report to you, so I'm going to tell you today. I've added a few more parcels to that side. But in 2006, uh, and I'm going to show you in some other slides, uh, I guess we have a question earlier about tax value of the base. I've got a report that shows that. But the reappraisal of that year that generated those was over 40% increase in value. That's a big amount of value jumped up. In 13, the value decreased because of the inequity, 3.4%. So there is some behind that number, and I'll show you this in some of these slides a little more detail about that. I've got a note for myself. But um, there's some other things in there too. I think our technology today is better. I think we still have a lot of stuff. We don't have a lot of turnover in our department, some, but not in the real estate area. I think these guys have a lot of institutional knowledge. I am very conservative in, in my value and approach to these guys that I am never going to walk into this thing with over 100%. I do have colleagues across the state when they get their reports back from the state, they'll be right at 100 or over, and a state will never show. I don't think over 100%. I've never seen reports, but I've looked at some of their statistics and spoons and something. I think they really pushed the envelope on valuing. I think there's a, a conservative way to do it for your community. The more you push that value, the more appeals you're going to have is what I'm trying to get at on that comment. So, but I do think the staff's uh, institutional knowledge and our technology today on how we do that has allowed us more time this year to really look back at the database the neighborhoods to make sure we were fair. We looked at good sales. We pulled in the remaining sales at the end to say, are we coming up with some good values for this? So I think there's a lot behind there too. Uh, 17, uh, let's talk about that. 
uh, informal period was when we first mailed it out around February 1st to when the board of the NR, the guys you guys appointed to it, um, met on um, April 19th. They adjourned. They came up with a, they convened, I think it was on April 6th, and then two weeks later come back and adjourned. Any appeals on that day was the last time you could appeal from the informal side. Crazy thought, but what makes informal different from formal? Informal is that roughly that 70-day window that you can come and sit down to the tax office and say, I think you might have made a mistake, I want bedrooms, you got more square footage, you got some bug damage, stuff that's going on, hurts my property, you may not be aware of. We talk with them, we meet, we fix those if they have them. Some cases we say no change. Formal appeal is ones that will go to the board of ENR, and they will also possibly go going to the property tax commission or even as high as an appeals court. There's very strict, strict time frames on those, all of those appeals. Informal is probably your little looser of time frame that they come in. 6900 is what we had. There will be no additions to that number. Uh, right now, of the 6900, 50% of those have reached the 30 day window and can't appeal in the formal. So we got about 3500 can still appeal on the formal side. As of yesterday, I had 103 formal appeals. That's really small. I kind of myself expected about three or 400. Now, commercials will come in at the end, there's no doubt. They have tax reps, they don't miss deadlines. But, I mean, we'll see a little boost there. But early in the game, I'm just not seeing a lot. It's so ironic, it's so much less than 2013 then. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It increases. Yes. So it's, you know, and I, I did, I've estimated the appeal loss at 340 million. Uh, I'll be honest and tell you, I'm not at that number right now, but I do have factor for the formal appeals that we have. Um, what you're saying is you're a little lower right now, but that number's going to come up. Yeah, I think we'll be close to it in the end. I do. Any other questions on any of those? Now here's the total how I, oh, yes, Jess, no, I'm sorry. Um, with the uh, estimated appeal loss number, can you just walk us through quickly, is that the aggregate of uh, just adding up all the differentials with each individual appeal, or was that generated from the sort of top-down? Yeah, no, that's, that's per parcel right there. I mean, citizens okay. that had a parcel that came in and said, we want to talk about the value of it. Okay, so there was no sort of top down of this is a percentage we're looking for of the total or anything like that. This is just add up every single appeal. No, we're still going to get that. One of the cool things that we did with IT this year, we created a, an appeal tracker. So yeah. we could put every appeal in it. And what we asked from the citizen was some basics like, you know, tell us what you think the value of the property is. What do you think the market value is versus what we assessed it? What are the things that are wrong with it? So we could look at the difference in that gap and say, what did we have it assessed at? What are they asking? So we did total that 6,900 to make some assumptions of what appeal loss would be. Okay. We did that. But this year, we put everything in the appeal tracker. If you mailed it in, went in the appeal tracker, we put it in there for you. We also imaged them. We tied them to the parcels that made that a lot easier. We don't you never want to lose an appeal like in your office. This place it doesn't. Does that make sense to answer that? Other questions on that? Uh, of that 6,900, just by the way, we'll, we have, I think, about 200 of those left that we're going to have to go out in the field on and do some looking at. Um, and the, 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 it's just something you can't read on a piece of paper and say, I'll make an assumption from that. You'll have to put some lines on the property. Any formal appeal, we will visit that property. I assure you. We'll put feet on it. We will look at it. If we go to the board and R on it, we'll have photos for them to look at it. That's just part of the thing. I mean, you want to be fair to everybody and say, if we're not seeing something you're seeing, really show it to me. I mean, you, you really want to resolve those if you can. So, total revenues. Uh, we talked about the real estate. Remember, you remember that number, 31.5. Uh, you kind of saw how it got there. Um, personal property. This has uh, things like untagged vehicles, boats, jet skis. Uh, manufactured homes like mobile homes, official name is manufactured, but we a lot of times we used to call them mobile homes. 
that are not attached to real. These are like in your parks that are being rented. Or any other. Actually, we have two sets of those. And one of the things I'm really looking at is how we might get better stability out of those. Personal property side has always been a little less on the line than if it's attached to a piece of dirt. Um, I think of, of that tax base of the personal property side, it's about 90 million uh, in value. And I think we need to look at that to be fair on the real estate folks that have own land and the mobile homes on it versus you're in a park. And it could be the same kind of mobile home in two different areas. You want to be fair with people on that. I think I see a little inconsistency sometimes on that. So I think that's something we're going to work to improve. But just let you know what's in that. Most of your business assets are in that number, 1.8 billion. Public service, public service values are not done low by local government. They're given to the Department of Revenue and then they're turned into the counties. Um, how those things are valued, they look at the income statements and they look at the balance sheets and there's a formula that the legislators have come out with. Roughly, when they, you look at their assets, they're worth about 55% is what they're being taxed on to what they've got in it. But they've got skin in the game to create jobs in the community or create other things that are in your community as well. So that's why they're different. They're a little bit different creature, and they, they brought that out. So it's, it's, it is a kind of a fair system. Motor vehicles, this one is, um, there's roughly over 200,000 motor vehicles that every month, there's registrations that come through. You go to the tag office now and you pay that. Local, though, we assess those, what we call situs those. We look at, like, we're, Mr. Presley lives and says, you got a fire district, you got the county. And we look at the Brownie Newman and we say, you're in the city, city, school, and county. So we have to cite us those. We try to do a lot of those electronically, probably about 90% of them are some we have to manually do based on our size and addresses. But there are roughly about 200,000 of those. The number I'm projecting here is really from July 1st to June of next year. So if you're reaching way out, and it's got some growth in it that I can kind of see. Hey, so just do a quick um, time check. Um, number 122, but we still have several presentations. Okay. So it's kind of moving along here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can take that. Okay. All right, here's my two important slides. I do want to spend a lot of time. This is my food for thought. Mr. Realtor, I think you asked about the tax codes. I'll put these numbers in here. You can kind of see F1, and I'm just going to go quicker through these since we're time. This is budget year, June. June uh, I mean, July 1 through June, or July 30th is what that is. Budget year looks at the last year, so at the top up here, they're looking like at June 30th, 18. Tax year, we assess January 1 of, in this column, of 17. So it's important for us to call a tax bill what it is. It's a 2017 tax bill, so value you put for 17. So there's, when we talk in terms of that, it's a little different, so I want you to point that out. Tax base. Is what this is, true taxable, not exempt. Here's a change in the tax base. This is your growth, is what that is showing. Now this report is based on the state treasurer's report on um, revenue neutral, this is the basis of this report. So when you're looking at this column, this is a, the change between these two years, but the most important thing on growth is only in these years, when you look at those. Can you say that again? When you're looking at the change in value between, for this column here, and this is the reappraisal years, <coughs> the larger numbers. And you can see, like I said, you know, that one year, uh, overall is 38, but real estate alone was over 40% that year. But what I'm saying is year to change, or change year to year is this number here. Is, you know, we went from, um, in our tax base, 13 to 17 billion. What I'm saying is an increase of three billion dollars that year that made 22 percent. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I am saying, though, the important thing of this slide that I want to take you into the next slide with is the growth in these years here, which is the average over here in this column. So that's, those numbers are the actual new construction happening in these years. Yes. So that in these years, yes. All that is growth. That's actual new physical growth, not taxable. Yes. Right. Taxable. That's an important number. And that's how, when I talk to you about managing your assessments, it's important to look at that. This far number is one the state says, what is just those years have been? 
But now, remember, if you can kind of see, and just, I'm going to go quick about it. Wrong. Still, I, I don't want you to rush. I think this is really, really important. Okay. Well, what I want to point out is from 98, or the budget year 99, there was a tremendous amount of growth in Buncombe County. There was a lot of commercial, there was a lot of residential. There was where, if you had a piece of farmland, it was getting snatched out of farmland to put a development on it. We've seen those all over the county. We've seen growth on like Airport Road. I remember when there was houses on Airport Road that I was assessing <coughs> and talking to people about. Hendersonville Road, it just boom. Leicester, Patton Avenue, all, all of our community has tremendously grown. Um, in real estate and commercial, when you get, some of the years I want to talk about here at O from, FYOA for the 2007, I don't think people realize that after we did the reappraisal in 2006 here, that we did jump 38%. But look how it grew. If you look at the growth or the value changes here in, uh, to me, 2007, 8, and 9, that's when we, I was still seeing a boom in the economy. People were like, you're crazy, man. I didn't see no boom. These numbers show it. That's growth that was there. Now, we did, I think at a national level, they went into a before Bumpy County, but we did go into the cycle where people lost, you know, their ability to borrow money. I, I can tell you, business and developers, developers that for years worked on a line of credit, they called me saying, I have no line of credit. I don't know how I'm going to pay any of my bills. And we had to work through those. But through these years, we had some of the strongest tax collection rates you ever believe, but we work with people. But if you look there in the 2013 tax year, there was so much inequity, and that's what I was talking about why we did this. We're trying to pick a date that, one, the market came back with some kind of stability in sales, that we could track sales. Because how do you do a reappraisal if you don't have any sales to measure? I can look at cost of a house. I can look at an income approach on commercial, but the stability is not there of the market. People are going to argue with you over appeals of that. Appeal from in 50%. Well, we began to see some stability in the community. I met with so many community leaders on should we do it, pull the trigger. And we wanted, we looked at that. So we finally did it. But the thing that's important in that year is the inequity. Um, and I'm going to show you the next slide. <coughs> You're going to see it. It's just incredible. And then if you get back into uh, 14, 15, and 16, you can kind of see the growth comes back. The key part of this slide is this column here. This is a number that continues to be added to the tax base year after year. Now, is it different? A little bit. You can look down through here. But when we're in our normal operating times, there's some good growth. Now, let me show you the next one. I think this is one, to me, that's very important for you to say. Food for time. This is the management of the tax phase and what the tax rates are. And I don't know if you guys have realized that you do this or not, but this is the tax year that I look at. Here is the sales assessment ratio. I'm going to cover what that is. And then here's your tax rates. These are the reappraisal years that you've done this in. Now, sales assessment ratio, that takes the assessed value and compares it to the market value. A little ours, but where we've done reappraisals. So when I did a reappraisal, we were at 96%. As the market increases, the assessment amount decreases on here. And you can kind of see when we get down to around 80, with Wanda, we're measuring, we're saying we need to do it, we're kind of getting into an area that's a little dangerous, a lot of inequity. There's things that your utility companies can request of you. A lot of management on that side. But as you look at these rates, we managed with that through our budgets through those years. We have that growth of about $500 million plus a lot of those years. So when you get, you know, like in 2002, you see we're a little stronger, 99%, 59%. And if you go up, you can see in 06, that's where we did it. And you can see the important thing to me there is look at 08 to 09. You can see assessments started getting stronger again. And you start getting into 12 that we were over assessing a lot of homes in this community. But, and we had to do it. There's so much inequity. So, and that was hard to sell on people. I guess I wish I had these slides back then. The last uh, you know, from 13 to uh, 16, you can see. At 13, we had the CRA district. So, 
well, I'll treat you there, but I think, I don't know if that added up to the same tax rate. I don't think it did, but I just want to show it was separate there. The county was truly 56 cents. Now, 17. And again, here's where I see, and I hear a lot of comments. I think you're at a crossroad. Do you continue to do this, or do you start setting a rate that's close to revenue neutral and start increasing year to year? There are some small towns that don't have the ability in our community, they have to increase their tax rates, like Weaverville as an example. Every two years, they're bumping their rate up a penny or two. Buncombe's kind of managed that for you guys through this, and you can kind of see over a 20-year history where our rates been to that. But we've had the growth, and the growth's allowed you guys to hold those rates levels we go through. Is the first year a little flush? Probably. Last year lean? Definitely. But it's something you guys have managed not knowing this. We wanted not worked on for a long time, but I wanted to point out to you guys. Questions? All right. That's it for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Gary? Yeah. Come down here. Make sure. Anything you want to ask right now? Just thank you, Gary. Great. Great. All right. Let's keep going. Josh and Hunter. Property tax being our largest revenue source at 62.7%. I want to give you a graph where we've been over time. Um, and you can see big changes happen really at, at retail time. Those are markets, so though. The asterisk. I do have a couple of 18 graphs out there because I want to show you. Without Rebell, we would still have had an increase. Our property tax would have been higher. With Rebell, I was projecting that our going above revenue neutral and our property tax would generate two hundred and seven million dollars. I want to talk to you about why property tax is so important to us. You've heard from most of our core services today, whether it's human service, public safety, and this evening you're going to hear from education. If you look at the expenditures for those three programs, those three functions, it's two hundred and eighty million of our three hundred and twenty million dollar general fund budget. Now, we do get some additional revenues. We get intergovernmental revenues, and let me just show you those. Um, um, can you back in the slide, please, before we leave that one? I just want to yeah. make sure I'm reading it right. So the two final numbers are both 2018. They are. The first is if this, there was no rebound. The second is if we just did the rebound and just let the tax rate where it is. No, that's oh, the just, tax rate we have. Oh, it's just based on recognizing that the updated valuation number, so that's why. Yeah, and uh, that, this one time, that's right. part of the recommended budget. Right. 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 Um, and I will come back to this, uh, but when you take a look at our three core services, and their expenditures being $280 million out of the bridge plan, I want to show you that in order, one of the revenue sources that applies to, primarily, or completely to our core services is intergovernmental revenue, and you can see that that has grown over time. That's a factor of a lot of what Mandy was saying. They tell you we have to do more. Now they compensate us, not always as well. And you saw some of her graphs where our county share has gone up. They may say, well, we'll give you a percent less or whatever. But it, these intergovernmental revenues offset primarily human service and emergency management. So, whoops, all right. So when you look at property tax and, and uh, reduce the, the three primary services to their net county costs, it's $215 million of our budget. Property tax doesn't generate enough money to cover our three core services. <clears throat> that's always been true. As, as many budgets that I've done, here, that's always been the case. There's not enough property tax to fund those three very key core services. So then we have to look to other sources of revenue. And our uh, intergovernmental revenue, I just wanted to point out, actually is 16.7% of our budget. So then we have to fall back on sales tax to, to finish the key funding in our budget. We finish the rest of the um, other core services and then fund a lot of our other departments. Our other departments have to generate revenues and, and we, want, we try to be very careful with the fees that we charge. So when we add up property tax at 62.7, intergovernmental at 16.7, and sales tax at 9 percent, you can see that the bulk of our revenues is required to do our core services. We do have core services outside of human service, public safety, and education. All of these are driven very much by 
you have discretion here on property tax. That's, that's the, the only discretion that the state really gives you. And we hear from Raleigh with great regularity when you have capacity. Our capacity is a dollar and a half, and that has to include um, what the what the uh, fire department tax is. So while we may have capacity, we also have to balance the people, the services we provide with the, the burden that it puts on the people who, who have to pay for those services. Intergovernmental revenues, they totally have, state and federal government have total discretion over how much of those we get. We saw those in the Andy's graph more clearly than can we get. Sales tax, we can only charge a sales tax, <coughs> pardon me, if the general assembly says we can, and then we can only levy, <coughs> levy it based on their directions. So if you look, does it have to be just approved by the board? Does it have to be uh, taken to a voter referendum? Or does it have to be um, shared? Like, do we share it with municipalities? And in our case, we tax the district in the county, yeah, which is the fire department, too. So you have, um, while well, this is a great revenue source, and, and there's $330 million worth of sales tax were generated by the county in 2016, we end up with 24. Well, in 16, we ended up with around. With, yeah, it's out of the joint calendar here, so it's, but we ended up somewhere between the 26 and 27 million dollars uh, in 16 out of the 330 million that was produced. But I don't say that to discount sales tax. It's very important. Our general fund is critically important to our school capital creation fund. Article 39 generates enough to cover our K-12. School capital fund commission has done a really good job of laying out a longer-term plan on how we're going to fund those things in 10 and share with you that, that information. Now for other things that uh, um, in Article 40 and 42 of K-12, you get a significant amount of money every year to pay for non risk and more type assets, whether it's equipment, major repairs, um, you know, those are primary things that pay for in 40 and 42. And then our most recent sales tax is Article 46, and we've been using that to fund AB Tech, which We've done a significant number of improvements over there. I want to talk about some of our options, but I want to share one more revenue source. Not because it's a big revenue source, but because it's a really good example of how things are changing right now. We're supposed to get back a percentage of the Bureau of Wine tax that's charged in Buncombe County. The municipalities also get back a percentage, and usually we get the full amount. Well, for whatever reason, these revenues go initially to the Department of Revenue, but they have decided to level what they're paying us. So instead of getting the growth, um, we're projecting we'll get 625000 both this year and next year. Not this year being in the 18th budget and the 19th budget. They've been pretty clear that not to expect an increase in those revenues. This is not a big revenue source, but it's a revenue source and a really good example of how the state can start paying little amounts and we can lose them. Several years ago, we used to get um, an inventory tax. And so it really was a payment in lieu of charging inventory tax because the uh, state got rid of it a number of years ago. And what they decided to do was just eliminate it. And that, then they always said, well, we'll pay you this instead of. Well, that instead of doesn't usually last very long. And if we go back to, oops, we go back to sales tax, while it wouldn't be a huge bar here, in 2017, we lost six hundred thousand dollars. So if, you, if we're still at a shoot that, while this is a good curve, I mean, well, I'm not a graph, the curve, it would have been a better curve. One of the things we do have some anxieties about, are we all watching here close? I'm not sure we have anxieties right now. Um, in 2018, if they might change the factors that used or used to distribute sales tax, we would lose one point four million. Now not that good. They usually give us some years notice when they do that. So we are, we are uh, banking on their past behavior in terms of implementation of So we've heard a lot of, uh, from a lot of our departments. So if you, were to, if you were to just look and say, okay, what, do we, what options do we have? Well, we do charge fees in a number of areas. Uh, and you can see that in the spreadsheet for the budget. But we try to remain competitive. We don't want our fees to be high, you know, higher than uh, we caught you saying the city of Asheville, we try to stay even or, or below some of those. 
Um, we also didn't want to charge a fee like a tipping fee that we send our trash out of the county, send it to somebody else because we have fixed costs at our landfills. So we have to be very careful about having a competitive tipping fee. So while we have options with fees, we try to keep our fees competitive. Um, we could, um, I mean, one of the questions that came up is we could look at the school fund balance uh, to see if there was some of that that, uh, that could be drawn down to <coughs> some of the one time things. We do have sales tax restrictions, but um, as we look at where those are and how can we adjust what we're doing, um, we don't have a lot of discussion with Article 39, but as we look at having built out what we need to build out, we and start to build that balance, we can look at pay-as-you-go pay versus uh, actually uh, borrowing for that. And Article 46, we, when we in initially passed the resolution, it was for Aggie Tax School Capital. I mean, there's always the option of saying, well, you can use it for major maintenance and operations, too, at, at this board's discretion. So I think there are some ways that we could look at some of our sales tax to do our future planning. And, uh, so those are those are options, and as we pay off our debt, monitoring that closely, looking back to tax fees, so what we can do with that is also something we need to keep in mind. So I think there's some options that we can look at, but they're very much a policy and a decision in terms of how we like to move forward. An hours late, and I feel like I'll need to be out of here, uh, so I want to answer your questions now. <laughs> what would be some of the things we could do with this? I'm sorry. What are some of the different things we can do with the sales tax? The sales tax, oh, you keep, we use this stream of sales tax coming into the general fund really to finish paying for our, our mandated core services. Right. Uh, so there's not a lot of discretion with this sales tax. I do think there's some discretion as we look at, uh, we don't have a lot of discretion over 4042, but as we look at 39 and how we use that going forward, uh, especially as we build out our, uh, our measurements. <coughs> If we can look at how that how we manage our debt with that. And I also think with Article 46, um, AB text needs are not strictly captured. So I think that we could look at being able to do some of that for other other functions inside AB tech. Um, and I think they might be recept very receptive to that. Um, I'd be I'd be supportive of that. I mean I think the the dedication of 100 percent to capital has been great. I mean you have the LA Health Building on the this training it's done a lot of good but um, I think that having some more flexibility for the different need that they have would be would be useful. So I think I think they were looking at that. I'm not Appreciate that. You know, you've had a very consistent view on that on that position. I think the um, you know my personal view is that I I think we want to you know I think we want to get your process to lower the property tax rate as low as we can. Um, but we also have some important needs to address, and I think having some more flexibility with that um, still having still having that dedicated AB tech, but if we can meet the different AB tech needs, having some flexibility within that. Like a little, um, there, little, uh, before you have money in little, you know, uh, make sure we can address their needs. But I think it'll also have benefits in making sure we can lower our tax rate as low as we can and still meet some of the key priorities in the budget. So I'd be in favor of talking about that further. And when I voted for that, I was under the impression that down the road the county commissioners could change that. No, but it's also that they, we could change it. Because if you look at state law, that does not say it's, it's up to us. I mean, you know, even though we said at the time of the vote, yes. But it's still my understanding when that's why I voted for it. You know, that it, the commissioners needed to change it. If we had something else we could do with somebody, we could. Maybe I misunderstood it. I don't know. No, that's, yeah, that's correct. It is. Was that way? Why didn't we have it where they were still didn't buy an election? 
Why didn't we just put it on the ballot? Well, we so, have nothing to do with what the school did. Well, that's like I said, we didn't put it on a yeah. county run ballot, it was put in a city election. And basically, city voted for it, which you did get to vote for it. And some people in the county did. Uh, 500 votes. And I told you why I voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Green, just jumping tracks for a second. Could you walk us through one more time the discretion that, or the op uh, opportunity that may exist around discretion of Article 39? Article 39 has a lot of restriction on it. Right. It has to be used for K-12 capital. Right. Uh, we've, I think we've done a really good job meeting their needs and uh, getting to a point where uh, now their, their projects are smaller. Right. So as that, uh, as we get through the next 72 million, 80 million, I can't remember, I mean, it's been well thought out by the School Capital Commission Fund to take a look at it over several years and over two years at a time. There is going to come a point where um, that balance will start to build. But then our discretion really is around do we borrow money or do we do, do pay as you go or do we okay. do we have some options to pay off a little bit early? Okay. Paying off early is not as easy. And I know okay. Thanks, Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay. So, is there a broad application of capital um, back to Article 39 here? Looks so, bricks and mortar over $100,000. You grab the bill and turn it up, shake it, and it fall out. And then you have to do it. You guys see here we go to some of the, when I heard the city schools, a lot of them have decided they're you going know, to put their money into the expensive, you know, the projector. You know, and, and that was, I'm sure, paid for uh, a couple of months. So it's a silly way to look at it, but it's pretty much. Actually, those things get paid for out of Article 40, 42, and then the city owns their supplemental tax. Yeah. Usually, what can be paid for out of 39 has to increase the life of the building, uh, improve the life of the building, oh, increase the building. Oh, right. okay. the parking lot, those are sort of the recurring maintenance that we see on them. Commissioners, other questions? Or so do you, why do you think Article 39, I'm going to ask this, I'm going to ask my board because I mean, bad need of a cup of coffee. <laughs> but, um, but it would be good to know if, if, if part of 39 can be worked out. What's specifically? Article 39. 39. Okay. I'm to yeah. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to track this with other commissioners. <laughs> okay. But, um, Article 39. Specifically, not necessarily this environment, but send it to us specifically what we know can be done, not what we think can be done. Based on statute, what we know could be done so that if there's an option, we would know what that option would we'll be. We'd be glad to clip that sentence to you. It's very clear. Article 39 for school capital applies only to Buffalo County. The other 99 counties are not. Do not have oh, yeah, this. I get it. Yeah. So, but nobody before, has anybody before, yes, has any commissioners looked at that before? Yeah. Well, it's the one we changed last year with uh, Senate 888, yes. where instead of doing that ADM, yeah. we're able to, yeah. to look at needs and meet needs, which I think was a big move forward in terms of being able to be a broader range. So that made, it some, that, made, that made the difference to where we're able to be able to even have that discussion. Yes, it does. Okay. Right, that's helpful. Sorry. So if we were going to change that again, it would have to go to legislative process. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you have three more minutes. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> been here this long. Three, three minutes, minutes on this. This will be quick. Yeah, that's the thing. Anyway. Um, we, we always get questions about, okay, where do we provide our services? So I think we've got a three minute video that we want to show you. Awesome. And as you pay attention, if you look in the upper left hand block, you'll see what kind of services we're populating onto the graph. And uh, sometimes we'll look at both corners as we get toward the end. There's a point in there where we also show you by district the kind of services that you might get calls from your constituents about. And then we wrap it up in, at the end, just kind of layering it over. But you've got to read the upper corners to really see what we're doing. And when we get to the districts, the district will be in the bottom left hand corner. This is three minutes long.
tall bars just mean there's a lot of calls to that uh, site. HR director. Um, so I was asked to prepare some stuff regarding uh, county personnel and basically dealing with compensation and how we compensate our employees. I think the first thing that you probably gathered here today to state the obvious is that we have really good employees. And that's probably our main asset. You know, what we do is we deal with people and we have really good people who, uh, who really go above and beyond. And I think you can see that in a lot of our things. So, I have the general fund position count by year. So this, I think, is an important slide to show you how we have, uh, and this is just for the general fund positions, how we have uh, really tried to keep our personnel has actually decreased from 2008 to the present. We basically are down, or we have, we're not using 117 positions. So right now we have 1,442 uh, pos funded positions. And when I say funded position, I mean a fully benefited position. So this is a person that's getting health care, life insurance, all of the county benefits. We also have temporary employees, but they do not get those benefits. Uh, so I want to be clear on that. So this is just that thing once again in the graph. I think that you can see where the big dip, I think if you recall when that dip happened is when we had the cultural uh, recreation authority and we took a bunch of employees out of the county and they moved to the CRA and then you can see in 2015 where we went up all the employees in the CRA came back and when we said that for those of you that weren't around that was library employees and employees that were in parks and recreation they went over to have an authority so that's kind of how we kind of got the dip and came back so what is our workforce? So just kind of a breakdown. We did some percentages about uh, the years of service with the county. I think what you find is a very interesting number is that 32% of our workforce has been here uh, one to four years. 
Okay, so we have a lot of people, but um, you know, we have, so, so that would be the one number I wanted to point out on that. Then I have breakdown in age, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because we have uh, basically most of our employees are between 30 and 54 years old. That's really where a bulk of our employees, and what that tells you with years of experience with the one to four is that we're getting a lot of people who are really qualified who are in the middle of their career, so we're not bringing in a lot of new people. So people who have other jobs are wanting to come to Buncombe County, and I think that's really important to point out. So position management overview. So this is the important part. This is how we control costs. So we are a position management organization, which basically means that we cannot add a new position until the county commissioner says so. So each budget year, you will say, you know, essentially you will fund X amount of positions, okay? And if those positions aren't funded in that budget, then they would have to come at another time and request that. Um, you also, in the annual budget, approve the position classification and, play plan, and pay plan. So that basically sets what are the positions, what are the descriptions of those positions, and how much are we supposed to pay those positions. So we have over 604 different job classifications with, spe with specific job descriptions for each classification. And each classification is assigned something called a pay grade. And essentially what a pay grade does is sets a minimum and a maximum pay. Okay, so a, an employee cannot be paid below the minimum of the pay grade, nor can they be paid above the maximum of the pay grade. And that really sets that. So we have approximately 48 different pay grades. And the pay grade, really, that gets assigned based on the level of responsibility with your job. So we, you know, basically, the higher up you are in the organization, the higher your pay grade is with the more responsibility that you have. So I just wanted to give you all an example. So this is pay grade 67, okay? So the minimum salary of this is $39,725. The maximum is $60,669, okay? And we have it broken out into core times, okay? So, and these are just sample. We have a lot more, but these are samples. So we have arson investigator, inspectors, registered deed ones, EMT paramedic, and librarians. These are all paid somewhere within this pay scale. And some of that may be, uh, they're, they're not all paid the same salary, but it's usually a lot with department discre discretion. Like EMT paramedics, we have a ton of those, okay? So a lot of those are paid based on tiers, and they, they have what's called a career ladder. Or so based on their certifications, that defines what their salary is. But so everybody at the same certification level gets paid the same. Okay, so that's not always true, but in a lot of our larger positions, that's kind of how we work it for an equity standpoint, because it's very difficult to be paying people who are basically doing the same job different different salaries. That's not really, that's, we try to avoid that as much as possible. All right, so I put picked out where we have the large bulk positions, just to kind of give you an idea of the number of people that we have working, doing similar jobs. The largest is the IMC caseworker two. Okay, so we have 137 funded positions and they're all doing essentially that similar type of job. They all have the same job description and they're all paid after six months, they're all paid roughly the same amount of money. Um, detention officers is our next big one. Okay, so we have 135 of them. Then we have patrol deputies. And then these are the two social worker classes that, is, that are different classifications but they're paid the same. And IMC caseworkers. So, that just lets you know kind of the, the, the level of the amount of people that we have doing similar jobs and having to manage those um, and what those salaries are. So when you multiply those up, that's how you get the department budgets because most of our costs are in personnel. So what, how do, what are our personnel costs? So one of the things that, that we have to pay when we're doing our budget is salary. So that's essentially what your paid compensation is. Other things that we have to pay that goes on top of salaries are your benefits. So we have to pay, uh, the county pays a certain portion of the uh, employee's health insurance. Uh, we pay for life insurance. Um, we are mandated by state law to pay a certain portion to the state retirement. 
And finally, FICA taxes, which are federal uh, and social security taxes. So those are all added into uh, an employee's compensation. Um, and the last thing that comes into play is longevity pay. Longevity pay basically is a one-time payment that's paid uh, once a year to reward the employees who stay with the county. So that's basically a one-time payment that we make every year. So how do salaries change? Well, other than the normal where you get a promotion or you get things, in our personnel ordinance, we basically have, it's in, in Article 3, Section 13, each April, uh, we the, all the employees essentially get what is a CPI um, adjustment. So what we do is we look back to December of the prior year, and we figure out what was the CPI. So then, based on that number in April, essentially all the employees will get a CPI adjustment. So. This year, for April of 2017, it was 2.2%. So essentially, all those pay grades and everything that I just showed you, everything went up 2.2%. Now, some years, it's been as low as 0.1%. In other years, it's been as high as 3 So it really depends on what the CPI is. But that's a good measure because it really keeps the employee's salaries current and, and with inflation. So you're really not punishing them. You see some organizations where they don't fund a bonus one year, but they'll fund it another year. And sometimes employee salaries start to lag. That's one thing at Buncombe County. We haven't had that issue. The other thing is that personal cost is longevity pay. So the first thing I want to say is, is that Buncombe County does not do merit pay increases. Okay, So we don't do a review uh, and then say, based on that review, you get X amount of percentage increase on your salary. That happens in some organizations. It's kind of all over the place in the state. So what we do is, in, in order to reward our employees based on their knowledge and skills, we uh, reward them with longevity pay. Um, so back in 2012, we actually had to consolidate. We had three different plans at one point where the employees who were pre-2006 were getting a pretty good longevity pay. The employees between 2006 and 2011, not so much. But then post-2011, you know, they, they weren't getting very much at all. So that we had this great inequality. So what the 2008 County Commission did on August was basically create one longevity plan uh, that applied to all county employees regardless of when you were hired. So here's that plan. So then it basically, that is a percentage of your salary. So if you are employed here one month and you are here on December 1st is when we focus, you can get $100. Just you can be here a week and you would still be eligible for the $100. And then for our longer employees, it goes all the way up to, to 7%. And that's based on your years of service with the county. All right. So. I just wanted to compare sort of what we get. Just a quick question. So the longevity system is how people uh, pay increases over time? Well, it, it, it's one thing, right, because okay. you have the CPI adjustment. Right. Okay, so that's it. But then longevity pay, based on your years of service, you get that additional check. That so that's the mechanism where someone would go from the entry level for position to the other end of the spectrum? Well, no, not necessarily. Some, some okay. positions have what's called career ladders, okay. and some don't. Um, so there, there are some positions like an EMT, they have a career letter, uh, our permits and inspection, they have a career letter. So those things more is dependent on your certifications. Um, but a lot of positions don't have that. And so basically their, their means of increasing their salaries are through the CPI and then through this one-time longevity payment each year. Okay, well, salary is not increased by this amount. Yeah, their salary is not by the longevity. Okay. So the only way a salary would increase for some people would be CPI? Well, we also look at this. Well, right, but, but that's not a salary increase. They're saying that's a lump sum. It's paid every single year. So that's what I was going to ask. Right. Yeah. You get that, if, say if I was 10 years, I get 5%, 11 years, whatever. You'd still get this 5% based on whatever your current salary is. So you, you get that every year. Term. Every year. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's good. I mean, you're, you're always balancing because merit, 
merit plans sometimes are very difficult to, to institute, and it's very hard, you know, and I wanted to go back to, you know, where you have 137 people. It is very hard to be able to quantify, you know, this person's doing a great job, this person's not doing a great job on, on that kind of scale and making sure that you're equitable. And we've really found that over the years that, that this, this has worked. It saved our management a whole lot of time because we don't have to spend a ton of time doing personnel evaluations for that. So longevity has kind of worked for us. And, you know, people like working for the county. I mean, and, and I think that, that our numbers show that, that people want to come and work for us. Um, and you outside of the county go to the business, you may have a stock program stock program or you may have something that they get because they've been there for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. The county could have been off of that service. This is what we have. Right. CPI is just to cover, to keep track of inflation. You know, somebody yeah. made $20,000 in, in the 40s may need to make a season. In the 40s may need to make a season. You know, it is, but I think one of the things that's really good to point out, and I think that's, that, that I hope the commissioner, that you all keep in mind, is it that providing stability for our employees. Our employees know essentially what they're going to be getting. They're not constantly having to worry about, you know, this year am I going to get my 1% or are they going to fund me? I mean, we, we're very consistent. We really don't have a lot of those issues that you might see in other governments where it's on a year-by-year -year basis. So I, I think from an HR director's perspective, speaking on behalf of the employees, I think that that consistency is something that, that, that's good and I would encourage to maintain because I think our employees do react to that. I mean, employees know, hey, it's December and <laughs> it's time to get my longevity check. Um, so, as I said on this one, I pointed out sort of what we're doing for other, what through, through the schools, I went and looked at kind of what we're doing as providing a supplement to the teacher salary. So they would get their state salary, and then on top of their state salary, they would be getting the percentages here. So, so, for, so for a new teacher at Asheville City Schools, they get 8.5% 8, 8 on top of their state salary, which is great. I'm not, I don't want to compare that, but I want to say that we're right in there with our numbers are do match up to what we're doing, so there is that equity between you know, because teachers, EMS workers, sheriff's deputies, they're all important to our community and they need our support. Can you go back real quick? So this is for a 25 year employee, it's double here. What? What's kind of apples and oranges that have been Because that's, uh, that's comparing the percentage pay increase over the state-based pay. Right. It's supposed to be, um, you know, the, the longevity payment. It's just kind of two different things. I mean, it's just like they achieve kind of a similar thing, which is getting a little more money than your base pay, but they're, they're not exactly. Well, no, I, I agree with you, but I think also, though, that you, that all employees look at their salaries, and so what's happening in one area, you can't treat it in a vacuum, because everybody's kind of looking at what's going on, and, you know, what are you doing for the teachers? What are you doing? And, you know, that's something that really, that weighs on the mind of employees. So, I, you know, but I think we're doing a good job. I think we, we treat our employees very well at Welcome Town. Um, so I was also asked to give you a slide to show you, you know, sort of what the days off are. Uh, this is our annual leave schedule. So um, our annual leave is uh, essentially we've kind of, uh, grandfathered it for certain employees based on your hire day. But roughly, you know, a new employee here roughly will get 10 days. Um, that is on top of, we also have 12 days of sick leave. Uh, every employee who just walks in the door gets two hour or two days of personal time off. So we do try to make sure that our employees have a lot and work with those because it's hard for those new employees who don't have balances. Um, when they need to take leave. So we do try to recognize that and work with them. Um, so the last thing I want to do is our early retirement. That's something that we've been running since 2014. And I wanted to let you know sort of how early retirement works. So we told all the salaries for all the position, all the people who retired. 
Uh, and so their total salaries came out to be eight million four hundred forty-six thousand four hundred nine dollars. So that was the total salary of all the people in those positions. That's not counting the longevity payouts. And then we compared that to the positions either got eliminated or based on necessity, we had to refill them. So then we put in what the salary is for the for the new people. So the salaries for the people who were coming were lower. So that came in at about six million seven hundred fifty-seven thousand nine hundred forty-four. So what we figured out is that there was a reoccurring annual savings, theoretically, of one million six hundred eighty-eight dollars or eight one million six hundred eighty-eight thousand four hundred and sixty-five dollars. So that is something that, that, that we work on. Uh, we're constantly looking at those numbers. Um, but as I said, the overall trends are we're down, you know, from where we were in 2008. You know, the county is down a hundred, or I, I would say down, but we have got, we have saved taxpayers from having to fund 117 positions. Um, and so we're always constantly trying to look at ways to, to save money um, and and that that's really all, all I have I hope that kind of gives you an overview of, of sort of how how we do salaries how we control salaries um, if anybody has any questions please let me know where's the slide that shows the breakdown of the 1500 what's that slide that we had where we weighed 1500 and more oh yeah yeah that was way back positions out of the general fund, put them in the CRA budget, and then when the CRA was eliminated, they came, those positions came back in the general fund budget. Which one? I'm sorry. Which one? Which one? Which year did this come into effect? Yeah, the first early retirement was September 2014. That was when they first calculated by that date. Um, and then um, in the 14, 15 time frame, <coughs> We were, <coughs> the legislation we created the CRA and also eliminated it. So that all happened really in one fiscal year. So, from um, 2011, excuse me, this is 1400, and then we have a drop in 2012, and early retirement don't come until 14. So, right. I think I'll run too back that it shows the whole graph. Oh, yeah. Maybe so. But you can also see that between two, that human services, a lot of that, that was the time when they started contracting out, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but they started contracting a lot, and we started looking at a lot of positions at that time around 2009. As you can see, where human services goes from like 677, and then 2011, they're down to 569. Wow. So... And, and I think that you can see that the numbers are fairly consistent. Um, Kurt, one question I have, and I don't need to get all this today, but just if there's some way to um, dive a little deeper. You know, the, uh, I mean, I think the longevity policy, I think it works well. Um, and, um, you know, but it's really not that much. I mean, if you think about the idea of other than just changes for CPI, which is really just keeping up with the cost of, you know, how much things are. If you think about to be here for 20 years and it's, you know, 6 or 7%, I mean, it's really not that much, right? So I guess the part I'd like to understand better is um, where a lot of the numbers move more is 
is kind of the, when you're talking about the career path, you know, maybe you have this level of responsibility now, but if you, I guess, get additional training or do, do things, then within your position, realistically, your salary can grow quite a bit. There and so, so for within the organization, how many different positions kind of look like that, you know, where there's that opportunity because if it was just longevity, I mean, for a lot of folks that, you know, you could say I'm going to be here for a long, long time, and really my salary is not going to change very much at all, but if there's ways to, to take on more responsibility, sure. share more skills, then that sure. So for how many people that is, uh, you know, is I an opportunity? You, I could get you that, that information and that right. breaks down. And it's also a little complicated, too, because in health and human service, a lot of times people are hired in at a lower salary and they kind of work against that until they get their credentials. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, it's not always apples to apples, but yeah, I'd be more than happy to go back through ladders and ways to, to improve um, employees' salary. I think one thing that I do want to point out is that a lot of our promotional processes, a lot of our employees are promoted from within. I think that, that that's one thing. You don't see Buncombe County a lot. We don't really train our employees, and, and our employees are really promoted from within. So there's a lot, there, there is a fair amount of growth. But you're right, for those positions, especially for social workers and, and, uh, and sheriff's deputies, librarians, where we have those mass people, I think developing a career ladder type thing would be a great thing. So. Okay. And I, I had a phone call, but could, could you type on retirement? Well, retirement benefits, basically, there, there, there are a couple different kind of retirement benefits that go on. First thing is the state retirement, okay? So that's essentially like a state pension that, and that's really between the employee and the state of North Carolina. We don't have a lot to do with it, but essentially, the employee contributes 6% of their salary into the state retirement. Once they re reach a certain milestone, then they are eligible.